Um, I want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, a few things which, which I hope will, will be useful uh, in the next, uh, next half an hour or so. And I do want to leave plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, the three main things I want to talk about um, is, is Kickstarter campaigns, pitching to publishers, and building a community. Uh, hopefully there'll be something in, here, in there that's, uh, that's useful. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background about myself and what I do first of all, so you have some context. So I run uh, a label at Square Enix called Collective. Collective is Square Enix's way of working with small indie teams. It's not a very normal thing, I think, for big publishers to try to work in this way. Our motivation is really to try to future-proof the, the industry in a small way, to help towards being able to give uh, the new, new talent pipeline, I guess, uh, some visibility and some support to stay in the industry. Effectively, what we want to try to do is to find teams which we believe have talent and which can go on and do amazing things in the industry, and to help them get from their first game to their second game, or their second game to their third game, so that they can ultimately retain as much creative independence as possible, uh, which usually means financial independence. And so everything that we, we do with Collective is aimed at helping indie developers to retain that independence um, with IP, with creativity, uh, and creative control on their projects. So we do that in three main ways. The first is by uh, helping teams to build community. We have uh, a website called Square Enix Collective, and uh, we publish on there a new pitch every week, and then we drive traffic to those pitches. And the idea is that we're trying to join the creators with uh, gamers and we want gamers to be able to give feedback on those pitches and also give the developers a sense of whether or not they think it's an interesting pitch and would they back it through crowdfunding. So quite a specific kind of use case there but it's great for starting to get some feedback on your game idea. We aim to give around uh, 20,000 unique users to each pitch and usually that will be quite a lot more than a game has been exposed to previously. Um, so that's the first thing. It's, it's a 28-day campaign. It's, it's kind of similar in theory to a Kickstarter, um, but um, it, uh, it, there's, there's no ties to us, and, and obviously it's, it's free of charge, so there's no cost. The second thing is then for some campaigns supporting them through a Kickstarter campaign, and we do that with uh, due diligence, so we help the, the trust relationship because we look into and try to understand what the capabilities of those developers are. Um, and, and that helps backers to feel good uh, about knowing that that particular campaign will uh, result, hopefully, in a good game at the end of it. And, of course, with marketing support. For that, we ask 5% of the net crowd funds raised as a contribution towards our costs. But at the end of that, there's still no tie to Square Enix. We're not locking you into something uh, unless you then want to talk to us about potentially publishing as well. Um, I don't want to go into all the details, but the... The uh, agreements are pretty straightforward. Developers always retain IP. They always retain the majority net revenue share. They always retain creative control um, of, of all decisions being taken. We bring marketing, uh, obviously sales, relationships with people like Steam, Microsoft, Sony, and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is build, help build sustainable businesses that can then go on and do interesting things. So enough of the sales pitch. Um, Hopefully that gives you a sense of, of uh, what we do. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is Kickstarters. Um, just before we start, uh, I'm going to maybe run a little competition uh, a little bit later, which is a complete surprise to the organizers. So sorry if uh, it's illegal or something, but I'm sure we'll have fun. Um, just put your hands up if you are working on a video game of any kind, either you know, in any discipline, you're currently, okay, great, we've got, I figured we'd have enough people. Okay, prepare yourselves because I'm going to ask for volunteers and, uh, and then we're going to vote for the best. I'm not going to tell you what, what people have to do yet, but we will uh, f we'll, we'll vote for the person who we think collectively has done the best job and that person is going to win a prize. So, <gasps> exciting. Um, anyway, before that, so the first thing I would say is, uh, and this is a big, big caveat, okay, there is no blueprint for success on Kickstarter. It is 
an emotional and unpredictable uh, process. There are no guarantees. Um, crowdfunding is inherently risky. That's true not just for backers, but also for developers. So this is not a how to win um, uh, thing. This is really a collection of observations and learnings that we have gathered over the past couple of years whilst we've been supporting so far 10 Kickstarter campaigns that have raised between them a million dollars uh, and all been successful. However, we have an inherent advantage because we have uh, a big marketing base that we can talk to. But this is a list of observations really about how to maximize your chances, but there's no one correct answer. So you could do all of these and still not succeed. Please don't blame me. I'm sorry. Um, the first thing is preparation. What do you need to do before, before you launch, ultimately? Preparation is really, really important. One of the reasons we started Collective in the first place was because we saw a lot of teams going into Kickstarters with no momentum, no marketing, no community building, and pretty much all of those teams didn't succeed. And the big problem there is that somebody might have an awesome idea, they might have a very capable team, but if you haven't got momentum when you start, because trajectory of the campaign is so, so important, you can't afford to get into day four or five and still not look like you're going to succeed. So do as much as you can, as soon as you can, to prepare. Quick hands up of anyone who is considering crowdfunding or Kickstarter. Okay, cool. So this is going to be, a lot of this stuff, what I would say, is, uh, is also relevant to if you're just looking to build community generally, or if you're looking to go to early access, or green lights, or something like that, or anything campaign-based where you're getting your game in front of potential customers. So think of the campaign as, not as the beginning, but as the end of the first phase of your public awareness. And you've got to do everything you can to build awareness. Um, use every platform you can. Uh, I've, I've mentioned Collective, but obviously there's Greenlight, uh, ModDB, um, whatever, you, whatever you can do that ultimately is going to help to get your game seen by people before you launch your Kickstarter is, is really important. Um, the key thing here is, this is a terrible phrase and I apologize for using it, but own the user. It's, ugh, it's horrible marketing. Um, what I mean by that is, not legally obviously, uh, we're definitely not going to go there. Um, but make sure you, ha you have their contact details. Make sure when you need to say something, you have access to those people. So where you're using something like Greenlight or uh, Collective or something like that, then in that situation, you access those channels for a certain amount of time. You try to gather those people in. But if you need to talk to them again, you have to rely on other people's channels to do so. So get as many people into your own social channels, into your mailing lists, so that when you need to alert them, i.e. the first few hours of your campaign or, or launch or whatever it might be, then you know how to get to them. Own the user. Um, press and YouTubers. Um, this is an assumption that a lot of people make that press and YouTubers are absolutely vital to every crowdfunding campaign or launch. Um, the truth is that they can absolutely make or break something, but nine times out of ten, you probably won't get any attention from either press or YouTubers. It's just a harsh, harsh truth. Uh, a lot of media will get possibly tens, dozens of requests every week, if not day, to cover unheard of games that are either going into crowdfunding, launching a demo, going on green light, or launching, uh, or going into early access, or whatever it might be. And you have to position yourselves and think of how readers respond to news articles about games that people haven't heard of. And particularly in the case of crowdfunding, let's face it, games that may never get made. From the media's perspective, sometimes there's something there that they might uncover that's very exciting. However, there has been a general backlash against media sites for covering games which ultimately then don't deliver and people get disappointed or frustrated. So media are in a difficult position about what they cover and what they don't. 
Yeah, we will, of course, always send out a press release about any game that we're covering uh, or supporting through Kickstarter. We do not expect blanket coverage, even though it's coming from Square Enix, and obviously they kind of know who we are. Um, we don't base our efforts on press. For YouTubers, obviously, entirely, or Twitch streamers, it entirely depends on your game. What do you have that people can play, that can use? Um, a lot of people will not be at the point where they have a really smooth, polished vertical slice. If you do have that, and your game is something which is going to look good once you know, a YouTuber's got hold of it, then great. That gives you a massive advantage. But usually, it's not appropriate. So if you've got a single player point and click, and it's looking a bit ropey, and you haven't quite had time to polish the logic or the AI, you kind of give it to these people, and actually, you're more likely, first of all, to not get any coverage. But there's the risk that if you do, that coverage will actually make your game look bad which is a disaster. So getting attention is very, very hard. Um, and you definitely don't want to be getting to like day 23 of your campaign um, before you're communicating to people. So you know, by all means, send out a press release. Try to get that attention through, through um, the, these kind of influences. But don't base everything on it. What I would say as well is that what we've seen it very much depends on the quality of the content in, a, in an article, whether or not that actually motivates people to go and put money against your campaign. Uh, we've seen uh, situations where a, uh, a Kickstarter campaign has had the top slot on, on Polygon or Rock Paper Shotgun or PC Gamer. And that coverage combined has really only generated maybe $250 worth of support. So. Again, manage your expectations. Something like that could be the difference between $100 and $10,000. But at the same time, it, it may not make the difference you expect. Um, if you want to, if you've got enough time and you want to try to get attention, to try to cut through the noise, particularly with media, think about starting small. Okay, Go to maybe local or regional uh, bloggers, people that have small sites to begin with, and make personal contact with them. Don't just send out a big blanket uh, press release to begin with. And see if you can get a little bit of coverage from a small blog, which very small circulation and, and awareness. But if you can get a quote from that, then you can put that on the next communication you send out. And it looks like you have some reputation, some provenance to, uh, to be able to then use. So the next person that reads it, you know, you've got a quote there. You can say, hey, uh, please check out my game. Um, and always try to use personal names, not just, hey, <laughs> hey, Bob, uh, Ricardo. Uh, um, the fact that you've got a quote from someone else tells the journalist who's reading it, someone else has played it, someone else has obviously thought it's quite interesting. OK, that immediately sets you apart from probably 80% of the other emails that come in. If you can do that three or four times and kind of start to build your way up that ladder, then by the time you get to the launch of your Kickstarter, hopefully you'll be able to actually send out a press release to the bigger media sites, and you've got four or five quotes there that you can actually use. Uh, and suddenly it looks like you know, you've been doing this a while. You're, you're much more likely to, uh, to, to get that cut through. Um, a lot of people ask, how do you set a target uh, for Kickstarter? Um, super important question. Can't answer that one. Um, it is the single most important question you have to ask yourselves. Here are some notes. There's no easy or right answer. Um, basically, the decision is between a low target, which is achievable, maybe something like 40 or 50,000 euros. Um, but that probably undervalues the cost of development of your game. So do you go realistic? Maybe it's 150,000. Maybe it's more. For a new team or, an, or a relatively unknown team with their own original IP, uh, that is very, very hard to do, particularly nowadays. Three, four years ago, a lot of people were taking more risks when they're backing games. Now, very, very hard. So you have to tread that balance between if you don't hit your target, you end up with zero. Um, so if you set the target too high because it's more realistic, you get the point. Um, what I would say is um, think about 
what you can do for your target. So, you know, if, you're, if the game you really want to make is 200,000 euros, if you can make a game that does every, every, every kind of, all the main features pretty well, but maybe it's reduced content scale, and you can do that for around 50,000, perhaps a little bit more, then that is the safest route. Because if you hit a target and you take money, you have to deliver. If you don't, then you will absolutely be stigmatized. Um, and that will affect your career, whether you, if you join big companies, if you stay independent. Um, and I absolutely would not recommend, even if it's through no fault of your own, you have to deliver. That's the bottom line. Uh, the benefit of, of going to Kickstarter and using crowdfunding support is, of course, that you get funding which doesn't have other strings attached. So it, people, you know, if you're taking money from a publisher or investor, then they'll normally be taking revenue share or equity in your company. So it's a big challenge, it's a big ask, but really think about how you're structuring your development when you make the decision to use crowdfunding or not. Um, what I would say is the ideal position you want to be in is within the first 48 to 96 hours to have hit 50% of your target. Um, this is because crowdfunding is a very, very psychological process. And ultimately, people will look at your trajectory at the start, extrapolate with a little mental dotted line, and if it looks like you're going to succeed, they will think you probably are going to succeed and they're more likely to jump on that bandwagon and then help with, with their own funding as well. People love to get in on something if they think it's gonna be popular. Um, if, they, if it looks like you're not gonna hit your target, even if they really like the game, psychologically speaking, they, they'll probably think, oh, that's a shame, it might have been cool, but I won't bother now. Stretch goals. Um, setting these, again, the ideal position is you hit your initial target early, so actually stretch goals become like a great momentum builder through the whole campaign. I'm not going to talk in a lot of detail about this, um, but ideally what you want to do is set your maximum target behind the scenes. So let's say, let's say for a moment you're going to set 50,000 euros as your primary target. That's, that's going to, what's going to get your game funded. Your maximum goal might be 250. Now, don't necessarily create all the assets with all the stretch goals before you launch your campaign because you might find that uh, on day five you are already at 70,000 euros. Great. Maybe you should go up to 300,000 instead of 250. You might find you're at 24,000, in which case maybe your stretch goals are going to be more realistic to 100,000. And there's nothing quite like a momentum killer then. Uh, you know, kind of hitting your target at some point, and then your first stretch goal is kind of double that amount, and clearly you're never going to get there. It, it renders the whole uh, premise pointless. So classify your goals. Try to keep them regular. Have m major and minor ones. Uh, you might have a minor stretch goal every 5,000, and a major stretch goal every 10,000. Try to make what you're promising with stretch goals mean something. The minor ones might be another skin for a character. The major ones might be another playable race or class or something. Don't put anything in stretch goals that you've not already costed. Um, this happens a lot with platforms. I see developers promising new platforms because they get a bit carried away with the momentum. It's like, wow, we've hit our target, okay. And then I've seen four comments in the, in the comment section say, I would really like a, a Wii U version. And the team look at it and think, Oh, we've got all these comments saying they want a Wii U version. Uh, okay, yeah, let's, let's put that in the next stretch goal. You know, we get, if we get an extra 10,000, we'll add the Wii U. And the truth is that you know, it's actually four people who really want a Wii U version. Um, that's not going to justify the cost of, of porting it. So think very carefully. Don't get too carried away. Um, if it's something that you can do, make sure it's costed. But don't make it cheap. Make it worthwhile. If you think there's a real demand there, use it as motivation to push people on and to increase their pledges. Um, assets are always really, really important. Uh, two main things I want to say about this. The first is your lead image and your one-line text, your, your sort of little subtitle. That needs to give people 100% of what your game is. You have to put people in the game. If your image is a nice logo and a bit of text uh, that sort of is a bit wishy-washy, um, 
no one's going to pay attention to it. If you don't have an established brand, no one cares about logos. What people want to see is, what's it going to be like to play? Use it, go through the exercise yourself. Go through Kickstarter, you know, the, the sort of the games index bit where, you know, all the, uh, all the images for the games are kind of like the size of a postage stamp or something. And see how many of those actually tell you what the game is. How many look at interactive. You, you can do something that's striking to, to grab attention. That can work. But if it's not telling you what is it to play, if it's a platformer, then try to make sure that it's platformy. <laughs> if it's an RPG, then have something that's, you know, adventure -y. Ideally, if you've got something that can translate and have gameplay so that you can see exactly what that moment-to-moment -moment stuff is like, then, then that's the ideal. Um, so a little bit of interaction. I mentioned the, uh, the competition. Um, okay. What I want to do is challenge people who are making games to explain their game using 10 words or less. So who's making a game? Everyone who's making a game, put their hand up. Great. OK, now keep your hand up if you want to play this awesome game. OK, right, I'm going to pick four people. Uh, so you in the white shirt there, uh, in the black t-shirt just there, gray t-shirt there as well, the Vans one, and uh, down here. I don't know, I probably shouldn't. There's someone else. OK, so you're just on the grace. So if, we, if we've got a microphone, can we, we take it around? And your challenge is you need to explain to the room what is your game. You have 10 words. I'm sorry this is going to be in English. <laughs> I, so I understand that you know, maybe it's less straightforward. Uh, and then at the end, we will all pick the one which we think is the most clear. So we'll start here. <laughs> Everyone's now counting on their fingers. <laughs> Obviously, in real life, you'll have more time to prepare. And also, you don't just have 10 words. But this is a good exercise to get into. Who, who are we starting with? Where's the microphone? Yep, first, first one here then. Do you want, yeah? OK. What's your name, first of all? Uh, my name is Diogo. Great. OK, 10 words. Ready? OK. My okay. game. OK, wait. OK was one of them? No, OK, right. It's a game about traveling. It's a game about it's a game about travel. Adventuring. Yeah. And making things. And making things. And making things. I'm counting syllables. I don't know <laughs> things. Okay. Well, that was under ten. So. Oh, uh, beyond creation. No, that's eleven. That's no good. <laughs> no. Eight, eight words. Beyond creation. Two more. Okay. Beyond creation. Ten right. Words. Okay. Repeat it again. It's a game about traveling. Adventuring and making things. It's a game about traveling, adventuring, and making things. Beyond creation. Beyond creation. OK. okay. Interesting. Who's next? So keep, keep that one in your heads. And at the end, I'll get you to do a round of applause for which one you think was best, and we'll go in order. It's highly scientific. Can't fail. <laughs> uh, we, OK, so this one here. OK, first of all, what's your name? Sebastian. OK. <laughs> May I start? Go. 4x. Four 4x. Four mixed with real-time strategy and asymmetrical maps. Planets. OK, do that one again. 4x. I'll give you 4x as one word. How's that? <laughs> it won't change a thing, but OK. 4x yep. mixed with real-time strategy and asymmetrical maps. 4x mixed with real-time strategy and asymmetrical maps. OK, good. Don't clap yet. Calm down. We've got two more to go. Uh, OK, so we had, I, there was, so there's a guy just there, you. I'm pointing straight at your face. Uh, no, it was, yeah, you, yeah. Down, down a bit. This guy, you. Put your hand up. Oh, you don't want to do it anymore. OK. You. Behind the guy in the white shirt. Left one and up a bit. I need a laser pointer. Is it me? Behind you. You're the one that put your hand up. With the, with the, the you don't want to do it now. OK, so you next one. Yeah. Preparation. Um, hi. OK, uh, what's your name? Andre. OK, go. Uh, so it's a... Uh, <coughs> Uh, free to play, uh, quick fire. With fire? 
quick fire. Quick fire, okay. Um, Turn-based card game. Or if I give you free-to-play as one word, you just make that. <laughs> it's a free-to-play, quick-fire... Uh, Turn-based turn card game. Turn-based card game. Okay, has everyone absorbed that one? It's a quick-fire, it's a free-to-play, quick-fire, turn-based card game. Yeah. Okay, everyone got that? Okay, and the last one was the guy in the van's t-shirt just along. Uh, too bad, I've, I've already picked. Uh, <laughs> uh, hello, my name oh, is Oh, you've Eric. written it down. Oh, that's, yeah, I've, look at that. I, I've counted the words, so I'm, I, I know I'm cool. That's the very good. words is all right. Uh, it's a classic RTS with it's chess aesthetics. With, sorry? Chess. Chess. Aesthetics. Chess-based aesthetics. It's a... Classic RTS. With chess aesthetics. With, yeah. It's a classic RTS with chess aesthetics. Yeah. Okay. I can't remember any of them, I'll be honest, uh, because I have a rubbish memory. So I'm going to rely on you to remember, because at the end of the day, you're, you're going to choose the winner. So uh, let's have a round of applause if you think the first one was the best one. OK, cut. Not bad, not bad. Uh, round of applause if you think the second one was the best one. Oh, OK, a little bit higher. Okay, so the third one, which was the free to play card game. Round of applause, you think that was for some? Mm, that was a little bit lower. And if, uh, the final one that, with the chest aesthetics. Okay, so clearly the first one was the winner. No, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Well done. Uh, come see me afterwards, and uh, you've won a prize. It's a collector's edition of the Turing Test, which uh, was uh, the last collective game that we released last month, and is currently 90% on uh, Steam, and uh, it's a great game. Good. Thank you. Anyway, the point of that, there was a reason. It wasn't just, you know, a bit of a laugh. It's actually really hard to get nail what your game is in a very short space of time. Now, as I said, it's not like you only have 10 words. You might have 15 or 20. But still, you need to convey what it is to play the game, okay? What I was interested in, a, a lot of times we hear um, people use other games or other reference points to get people in the spirit of their game. So uh, one cool Kickstarter I remember uh, seeing was the description, it was, I think in fact we supported this one, but the description was their idea. And they said it was a mix of um, uh, Babylon 5 meets FTL. And that was kind of the main uh, sort of context. There was a little bit of extra, you know, in a dangerous galaxy or whatever it was. Um, but ultimately, what it did, it gave you two games as reference points and said, it's this meets this. And so you're thinking, oh, okay, well, I sort of understand what Babylon 5 is and I know what FTL is. So it helps just to get you in the mood. Um, that combined with a really cool piece of key art. People are in the game, they understand what it is, okay? And the last thing you want to do is, is cause confusion. If people don't quite get it, they're probably just going to bounce off and go somewhere else. The other main thing I want to mention about assets, so that point about key art, by the way, uh, and explaining your game, is true whatever point you're at, whether you're pitching, whether you're uh, launching a crowdfunding campaign or releasing your game, uh, and you're, you're trying to find the right text for Steam. Okay, that's super important. The other thing that goes across all of those things is if you have a video, a, a trailer for your game. I don't want to be rude. Actually, I'd love to be rude, but I'm not going to be. <laughs> it's been recorded, so. Uh, um, chances are people will not have heard of your game before. Okay? There's no shame in that. 98% of the games out there, no one's heard of. So don't look at triple-A game trailers and copy what they do, because the rules are different for those guys. If you're working on a Hitman game or a Just Cause game or a Tomb Raider game, we assume that most people who are going to be watching the trailer pretty much has a pretty good understanding of what those franchises are. So we can afford to, you know, play on logos and concept art or key art and maybe build up a narrative slowly with kind of cutscene footage or something like that. If you're a small indie game that is not part of a big franchise, don't waste time. You might have 10 seconds. Most people 
will not last more than 10 seconds in a video trailer. Um, uh, the, uh, the attention span is very low. Uh, and if, if people don't get a sense of what they're getting into within that very first 10 or 15 seconds, then again, you've lost them. There's no sense in trying to hang on, pe hang on to people longer in the hope that they might stick around and then you can almost trick them with your gameplay. It just doesn't work like that. So give them gameplay within the first 10 seconds. Okay? Give them whatever it is you've got, vertical slice, even if you're doing it from gameplay mock-ups or GIFs or whatever, get into the, what the game is, the moment-to-moment -moment stuff. Again, if it's a platformer, show platforming. If it's an FPS, show shooting and moving and jumping and running, whatever is the thing about your game. Um, I see so many times people starting off with a, a logo and then another logo and then a line of text that says, in a world. <laughs> and then that fades out and then it's replaced, one man. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I mean, you just can't get away with it. So use your opportunities. In the rest of the pitch, use GIFs. Um, again, anything that can show character of what your, your gameplay style is, that, that animates the character slightly. Personality is really cool. Make sure you talk about the team. People like to connect with the developers. Uh, the game is always more important. Don't make that mistake. Uh, I've seen that happen. Uh, but you know, make sure that, that you people know why you're doing this. Pledge tiers. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this. I've got some notes here which I'm happy to share with anyone. Uh, if you just want to DM me on Twitter, then I'll send you an email of, of, of the notes from today. So there's a little bit more detail. Um, the last thing I want to say about crowdfunding campaigns, this is true of, uh, of, of you know, other stuff as well, like Greenlight stuff, is be prepared for the long haul. Um, it's a very, very hard experience to go through. It's exhausting. It can be extremely demoralizing. Um, Usually, this is what you should expect. The first few days kind of does this. Then the middle 25 days does that. And then the last couple of days does this again. Okay? So that's why you really want to make sure that trajectory at the start leads to, leads to what people are going to look like as success. <laughs> Plan for it and expect it. Keep doing updates. Keep adding stuff to your campaign. Don't keep a massive update for halfway through get all the big stuff out at the start, because that's when you're really going to pull people in and make them excited about your pitch. But anything you can do to upsell existing backers by, I don't know, introducing a new early bird tier or, or something like that, try to keep that momentum going, but just be prepared for the fact that, yes, it pretty much flatlines for everyone. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about uh, pitching to publishers. How are we doing for time? OK, not, not very long. Um, so I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Again, a lot of this is, is a similar sort of perspective from the Kickstarter stuff and the community stuff. The first question I ask is, you know, in terms of getting the meeting, what do you need a publisher for? Okay, be, be really clear about, do you actually need a publisher? Um, a lot of people sort of just assume yes, but actually if it's funding, there are different routes to funding, depending on where you are. Sometimes there's regional funding, sometimes investors, sometimes crowdfunding. Um, so, you know, think about whether that's something you actually want or need. And when it comes to getting meetings with, with publishers, that can be quite tough. So who do you know that has maybe spoken to publishers in the past? Can you get an introduction? What about, uh, you know, event organizers? What about, um, you know, regional trade bodies, people like the EGDF or something like that? Is there an event, hint here, where you might be able to network with people and maybe make introductions? Uh, you know, can you afford to maybe go to uh, like a game connection or, or something like that where, you know, even if you're not getting a load of meetings, uh, because that can be quite expensive in the meeting system, whatever, be around to hang out and ask questions. It's a really cool industry. A lot of people are happy to share information and knowledge and people generally will honestly try to help you if you ask. So don't be afraid to ask. Um, Clarity, I've sort of covered that. What is your game? Make sure you can express it well. Practice your one-liner. It's this meets this in a world with a man, whatever it might be. Um, transparency is really important. 
Maybe publishers don't have the best reputation for transparency. I don't know. But uh, we do get to see quite a lot of pitches. I've probably five or 600 in the last couple of years, just for me. And so we get a sense of what is normal. What would you expect to see for a certain budget from a, you know, in a certain genre um, you know, for a team with a certain amount of experience? So don't go in there thinking that you have to try to pretend or blag. Go in there and just be honest. Know your strengths. Know your weaknesses. Don't be afraid to say that you need extra expertise. That shows us that you understand there's a gap and you know that you know, it's going to be a priority to fill it. Maybe your net code isn't what it should be. So actually, you're going to hire a specialist for three months to fix it. Have all that in the budgeting. Uh, if you answer the questions that way before we ask them, that's, that's a much better way of doing it. When it comes to what, what are you read, when are you ready to pitch assets, hit a kind of a rule of thumb is this. The further you are from finishing your game, the more risk there is for anyone that's going to invest in it or take it on to publish. So the more you can do to show what that final game is going to be like, the better. However, if you don't have that perfect vertical slice or very, very polished gameplay demo, don't worry, you can still do the meeting, but just be aware that you have to make up the rest of that vision yourself. Okay? You have to de-risk it for the publisher you're talking to. So you have to uh, you know, bring lots of concept art, bring lots of, you know, if you've got final visual quality mock-ups, bring everything like that you can. Because then what I want to be able to do is look at your pitch document and your budget and uh, you know, perhaps you've got a grey box demo. That on its own, I'm not going to be able to visualise the game. I'm, all I'm going to be visualising is the grey box demo. If you've got then some you know, lovely kind of final mock-up artwork to go with that, I can do this plus this and, and you know, hopefully that, that vision all comes together. So think about what are we looking at, what's our perception, and how can you make it as easy a decision for us as possible, in a positive way, obviously. Um, and then for deals, the really easy thing is it's need versus sacrifice. Okay? What do you need? What are you prepared to give away? Always try to do the research on the people you're going to meet. So know what kind of deals they offer. Now, that doesn't mean the details, because this stuff isn't you know, normally public. But look at the kinds of games that those publishers have signed. If you can talk to those teams, ping them on Twitter or whatever it is, uh, and, and find out what they like to work with, even better. But, but have a, you try to at least understand, most, most teams you'll get a sense of, do they offer funding? Is it marketing only? Um, what level of funding? You know, if you've got a game that needs a million euros, it's no good coming to us because our cap is about 300,000. And right now, uh, we're, we're, you know, our kind of investment rounds are closed. So in the future, we'll open those back up again. But I'm not the right person right now. So I might love your game, but there's not a lot I can do about it. So who else is out there? Okay, so try to do your research. And if you can't find anyone to tell you, go direct and just ask. Um, you know, people might answer, they might not. But you know, give it a shot. Some bits on building community. So uh, if you're not looking to pitch to publishers, you're not looking to go to crowdfunding, um, again, a lot of the things about building community I've kind of referenced already. So it's, it's common sense stuff about the assets, about that sort of thing. Here's an important question for you. What do you want your community to do? Usually, people want the community to either test a game. They might want a community to evangelize a game and tell their friends and get more people in. They may well want a community to buy their game. Sounds crazy. So customers, in other words. Um, what you want from your community will define how you approach them. If it's about testing, then you don't have to give them a big hard sell. If it's about evangelism, then you want to try to include them and involve them in what you're doing so they feel almost like part owners of your project. That way they feel almost protective of it and they're more likely to be positive in, in, in the way that they talk about it. If it's about sales, then show your best face. Impress people. Again, start as early as you can. Uh, as soon as you have something that you can show, as soon as you can start talking about your game, go out and do so. Set up your social channels. Keep those channels going. Even if it feels like you're talking into a void, it's all context. And you'd never know. Try all the things. Push all the doors, because you don't know which ones will open. One super important thing, though, if you've got a team of 
three, four, five. Pick one person to be the public face of your game for, from the community's perspective. Okay, I know it's kind of nice to think that we're going to be really uh, democratic and everyone's going to get their, their time in the spotlight. But the truth is, people don't remember five names. They'll probably remember one name and one face. And it's a bit like pop bands. <laughs> you know, in the end, no matter how they start out, one of them always ends up as being the best known one. Um, so who you pick doesn't depend on anything really other than does that person have the dedication and the capacity and the desire to constantly talk about your game to people you don't know. And it is exhausting. Anyone can be a community manager for a couple of months in the same way that anyone can write a blog for a couple of months. I used to uh, run uh, websites, do uh, games media stuff, and when I'd hire writers, I'd be more interested in what people do in their own time than what they might have done in their you know, limited career to date. So if somebody had been writing their own blog about games for a year, very impressed. You've got to think in those terms. Can you really keep tweeting for 12 months about your game? Um, stickability is really, really important. And eventually, it will come good, usually. But again, you've probably got a long time of, of talking into a void. So try to find the person that can cope with that, because it's really exhausting. Um, that's all I have. Uh, as I say, if you want a copy of the notes, there's, there's more stuff in there, but I'm, I'm not going to go into it now. I do want a little bit of time for questions. I'm aware that we're already past time. This clock here says I still have 18 minutes, so I know that's lying. Uh, there's a coffee break, and I'm sure everyone, <laughs> everyone needs coffee. Um, feel free to contact me. Um, I will try and answer questions uh, on Twitter. I think we've maybe got a little bit of time for questions now. Um, I'm not being shot or anything, so if anyone does have questions, uh, just put your hand up. We'll try and get a microphone to you. Okay, there's, there's two in the middle here. Any others, just so I can... Okay, just two. All right. uh, what is the collective's stance on early access? Yeah, early access, okay. So early access is tricky because um, a little bit like crowdfunding, there have been some failures. And as with anything, failures can erode trust. Um, if you want to do early access, then I think it's a perfectly viable uh, approach. Uh, you know, We're looking at working with a couple of teams who, who have either been through early access or are considering doing that before, the, before we work with them. Um, and I think that it's a perfectly viable route. Um, but you've got to play by the rules. It's a bit like, um, otherwise it's a bit like delivering, uh, not delivering a kickstarted game. Um, keep update, update people. Just be transparent. People will forgive you if you miss deadlines. People will forgive you if something isn't working quite right. Um, as long as you keep communicating, tell them where they stand, tell them what they're up to, what you're up to, uh, and try to give them some time frame that you, you believe you can stick to. And I don't mean just for delivery of a final game. I mean for when you're going to fix things or when updates are going to come along, when feature X or feature Y should be implemented. And also, something really important that I don't see enough of is tell people what you want feedback on and be specific. Don't just put something out there on an update as you go through and say, oh, update 3.71X is live. Go crazy. Say, update 3. Point, was it 71x is live. Uh, see, my memory is terrible. Um, and please, can you uh, play and specifically test the AI branches or the, this part of the level? Or, or you know, give them things that you need. They're going to be valuable. Make them feel included. Make them feel part of it. Because then if something does go wrong and you do have an update that crashes things or you, uh, you miss a deadline, you'll have a lot more respect. So I'd say keep communicating, keep people in touch, and make them feel like they know what's happening. Never go quiet. Even if you might be working perfectly diligently and there's no dramas in the background, but if you go quiet for six weeks, people will assume that something is wrong and start panicking, and then the internet gets involved. Um, yeah, so does that help? Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, just in the moment. 
right in the middle. Literally, the people with the microphones have no idea who should be doing this. Who's where? Good. Nice. Uh, so, uh, you, you were telling that um, your company helped um, 10 Kickstarters, correct? Yeah. I was wondering if um, it's 10 succeeded Kickstarters or some had failed and you had uh, 10 that succeeded? Yeah. That's the first question. Okay. The second one is what you think about the other platforms. Yep. Uh, that other, are not other crowdfunding yes. platforms. And the first, the final question is um, for someone who is making the first game and is new to Twitter, what do you think is best? To create a personal account to bring people to follow or to create account, an account uh, about the game? A game account just with the name of the game or a personal? Yeah. Thank good, you. Good, good questions. Okay, so if I, if I remember them. Okay, so the first one was about we've so the Kickstarters. So we have supported ten Kickstarters in total. All of them have been successful. Um, nine of them were based on original IP. One of them was based on uh, an old IDOS IP called Fear Effect, which we supported as well. Uh, between them, they raised a total of uh, over a million dollars. So you know they average out about a hundred thousand dollars each. But some of them were two hundred, some of them were fifty. Um, we did support two other campaigns on Indiegogo, and this. It's probably going to answer your second question. Both of them failed. Uh, we did all the same things. In fact, we did more. Um, but we just could not uh, ultimately get traction. Um, so we took the decision after the last failure on Indiegogo to just focus on Kickstarter. Um, it's not impossible, but it just feels like there isn't the same level of gamers uh, in terms of community on, on other platforms. Kickstarter has, I think, the biggest gaming audience. And so therefore, if you're going to choose one, it's, it's, there's a logic there. Um, we don't work with any of the others. I mean, there's others out there like Fig, for example. Um, we, we don't have any direct experience uh, with those guys. Um, so I, yeah, I currently help. But particularly if you've got a new IP uh, and you're a, an, un, an, you know, an unknown team, I would go for the biggest possible audience, um, which you know right now is, is Kickstarter. And the third question was personal, right? Yeah. So this is really interesting, actually. No one's asked me this before. I would probably, for the first game, uh, go personal because um, I think right at the start, people want a sense of personality of who someone is or who a team are, and. I think it's harder to get that personality across with a game account. Pe people just don't warm to a, to a game you know, name or, or visual in the same way that they would warm to a name. And you're, it's about building trust. Um, I think obviously then that creates a challenge later. You know, hopefully with success, you'll have a difficult decision about when do you then set up a game brand account. Uh, and that's probably when you, you know, feel confident enough to uh, you know, maybe it's the second game or the third game. Um, I mean, you look at someone like Rami uh, Ishmael from Vlambeer, you know, and, and he has a gajillion followers. Uh, Mike Biffle as well. Um, uh, you know, both of those guys use their own accounts for personal stuff, but also promoting their game, and they do excellently with it as well. So, you know, there's no reason why ultimately you can't have both. Uh, if you do switch to a game account, I would still keep your own personal one going. Because, uh, you know, you never know. You might need it again. Cool. Okay. Thanks very much. I think that was all the questions. Uh, so I'm going to have to stop, I'm afraid. Sorry. Um, thank you very much for your attention. I hope it was useful. I'm based in London. Where? It's a bit sinister, isn't it? Should I be worried? Definitely worried. Uh, so it's uh, Blackfriars. <laughs> yeah. uh, Blackfriars near. It's near Waterloo, ish. Yeah. Feel free to say hi. Just for future reference. Okay. I don't. I don't know what to make of it. No, I'm kidding. Uh, okay. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here. Um, I think I'm back on stage uh, a little bit later to talk about goodness knows what, um, which should be fun. Well, it's a Q&A, so uh, who knows? Anyway, thank you very much.